Okay, in the uh, part one lecture for chapter 19, we had just taken a look at uh, red blood cells or erythrocytes. And so inside of the uh, red blood cells, you're going to find a protein called hemoglobin. And so uh, we'll talk just briefly about a few things about hemoglobin here. Um, number one, it is a protein. That's the type of uh, molecule that it is. And um, uh, it is found inside of red blood cells. And you can kind of see here on the, on the picture, on the schematic here, it is a what is called a quaternary structure protein. So it has four subunits um, for this one molecule protein, it has four different subunits attached. Inside of this um, subunit, protein subunit, would be what's called a heme group. Um, the heme group is where you find an iron molecule or an iron atom. And you can kind of see the little schematic over here. You don't need to know the diagram or anything, but there you see an iron. Uh, atom, this is where oxygen is going to bind to this molecule. And so the, the function for the hemoglobin protein is to bind to oxygen uh, and allow it to be transported or carried throughout the body inside of the red blood cells. And so uh, they estimate that each uh, red blood cell can have up to 250 million molecules of hemoglobin and that each one of these can bind up to one molecule of oxygen. So if you do the math, 250 million molecules of hemoglobin times four different subunits, uh, each one having you know, an oxygen molecule attached, then uh, you can have up to just about a billion um, molecules of oxygen inside of a red blood cell. Then uh, just a little voc vocabulary for you for hemoglobin. Um, just uh, take a note of these words, oxyhemoglobin, that just means the hemoglobin has oxygen attached to it. It's transporting oxygen. Deoxyhemoglobin, um, that means oxygen has been released, and so there's no oxygen attached to it. And then you have two other words, two other vocabulary words, carbaminohemoglobin. This means that it's actually uh, transporting carbon dioxide. And we'll talk more about carbon dioxide and oxygen um, and their transport through the, through the blood, actually, when we get to the respiratory system. And then uh, hemoglobin can also bind to something called um, carbon monoxide. And so this is, if that's the case, it's called carboxyhemoglobin. Sometimes you hear about carbon monoxide poisoning, and uh, carbon monoxide is a very dangerous gas. Uh, it's an odorless gas, and it will bind to your hemoglobin and basically block the transport of oxygen throughout the body. Um, also to talk about, uh, we need to talk about a process to um, form red blood cells while we're talking about erythrocytes. And so this process, uh, make sure you know this term up here, erythropoiesis, erythro is the same prefix for red blood cells. And then poiesis um, basically means the formation of, and so this is a process in which your body forms red blood cells. Now there's a multi-phase uh, type, uh, many stages here um, that we're going to just kind of briefly talk about. You don't need to know each of the each of the different terms here. I'll, I'll highlight a few things that I like for you to know. For example, you should know that erythropoiesis is the formation of red blood cells and that it takes place inside of the red bone marrow. Um, so that's the location. Um, and the reason is you find a stem cell um, that resides stem cells that reside inside of the red bone marrow that will give rise to the red blood cells once they go through development. And so the process is kind of showing you, we're not going to go through each little um, stage of that development. One thing to point out though is that red blood cells, remember we said that red blood cells are anucleate, well that's after they finish their developmental process, but when they're formed they actually do have a nucleus and that's shown here in the, uh, this these pictures here. They continue their development. Eventually that nucleus is ejected, comes out of the cell, and then finally have a functioning mature red blood cell called an erythrocyte. This process uh, though is driven by hormone. And so uh, even though we've, you know, we studied a lot about the hormones in chapter 16, uh, occasionally we, we, we will see a few other uh, hormones um, throughout the the course of the semester. And so uh, here's another one. This one is actually produced by the kidneys. It's called erythropoietin. Again, it uses the prefix erythro because it has something to do with red blood cells. 
and uh, poitin just means that it's a hormone that uh, helps in the formation of red blood cells. And so um, the scenario here is that whenever your blood oxygen levels may be low, that can actually be detected by the kidneys. And one of the things that the kidneys can do is to increase the production and release of this hormone called erythropoietin. Sometimes it's abbreviated EPO. And so that erythropoietin, as any other hormone, it goes into the bloodstream where it finds its target tissue. Here the target tissue is, resides inside of the red bone marrow. It's basically the stem cells um, that are inside of the red bone marrow. And those um, stimulate the production of uh, the process to make more red blood cells and that gets released. More red blood cells means more hemoglobin and that's better transport of oxygen. Uh, I want to back up once, let's see, I want to back up one or two slides. I want to show you uh, one other vocabulary word that I didn't mention before. Um, sometimes you'll see this word hematopoietic or hematopoiesis. Um, if you see hematopoiesis or hematopoietic, it's talking about the formation of blood cells in general. And so if it has erythro in front of it, then that means it's the formation of red blood cells. But this hematopoietic stem cell basically can, can be formed and develop into any type of formed element or any type of blood cell, including red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And so just remember that if you see the hema, hema part, either hematopoiesis, or in this case, hematopoietic stem cell, it's referring to the starting cell that can become any of the blood cells. That brings us to uh, section three on leukocytes or white blood cells. Again, make sure you know the word leukocyte. And um, there's basically two main uh, categories here. We're gonna spend more of our time in lab talking about um, the different individual types, but we'll kind of mention the two main types here, granulocytes and agranulocytes. Um, as, the, as the word implies, a granulocyte is a cell, C-Y-T-E, that's a cell that has lots of granules or large granules. And so these are visible whenever you use a stain, you can see these granules most of the time in these cells. We'll talk about in lab three different types of granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And here's an example picture of a blood smear. All of the pink, red, pinkish, reddish type uh, small circles here, all of these would be red blood cells or erythrocytes. The, um, the white blood cell here, um, that's labeled with an N, that's a neutrophil. The uh, relatively large white blood cell here is very stained uh, and very dark on the inside. You can see all the grains or granules that are here. Uh, that's an eosinophil. And then we have a different type of white blood cell on this right side called a monocyte. And we'll talk about that in lab. Um, the agranulocyte, definition number two up here, um, is a type of white blood cell that has, it still has granules, but they're relatively small and they don't show up as, as well. By the way, a granule, if you remember from 168, is like a storage vesicle. It's how the cell stores chemicals and stores uh, maybe enzymes and things that it needs. And so we'll talk about the two types of agranulocytes in lab, a lymphocyte and a monocyte. Leukocytes or white blood cells have um, Kind of a special type of movement and so I've got three terms here for you, three vocabulary words that help to describe how white blood cells have this special type of movement. Number one, they move like kind of like an amoeba, um, just like that single-celled uh, organism you may have studied in some basic biology somewhere along the way. Amoeboid means that they move kind of like an amoeba. So <clears throat> in this diagram down below you see a white blood cell. This happens to look like a neutrophil and it's in the inside of a blood vessel, um, it can attach to the blood vessel wall and then kind of move itself. You kind of see these little extensions out of the cell. These are called pseudopods and it kind of helps the blood cell kind of walk along or move along the edge of a blood vessel there. And then uh, number two vocab on this slide is diapedesis. Um, and that's just a uh, fancy way of saying that these cells they become thin. You can see a white blood cell here where it says uh, F on the diagram. The white blood cell kind of becomes thinner and it squeezes itself in between 
these two um, blood vessel cell uh, cells here in the in the blood vessel wall it squeezes out through there so that it, the white blood cell can actually come out of the bloodstream and it goes out into your tissues. So that's the second type. And then the third type is chemotaxis. Uh, chemo refers to chemical, taxis refers to movement. And so this is where a white blood cell may move toward um, the location it needs to, to go in. And so white blood cells help with getting rid of infection and they help damage cells and they help you know, clean up bacteria or dead cells or, or debris. And so chemotaxis, if a cell gets damaged, if a cell gets damaged, then it releases chemicals into the bloodstream. And so these, these white blood cells can detect those chemicals and they can start moving toward that chemical area. Then um, the figure here um, shows you the steps to uh, form the white blood cells. Now we're, gonna, we're not gonna go over the, um, the processes here, but again, I do wanna point out uh, the name leukopoiesis. And so that is a, um, that's your name for white blood cell formation. Again, it takes place inside of the bone marrow because it comes from, it begins with the same hematopoietic stem cell that you get your red blood cells or erythrocytes. And so the chart actually does a good job of kind of showing all the developmental stages. We're not gonna take time to go through the developmental stages. But as you can see, this one stem cell that's inside the red bone marrow will eventually mature, develop, and then differentiate into your lymphocytes, your white blood cells, your monocytes, your basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils. So all different types of white blood cells come from that same stem cell. Um, there's, you could also add a line from this stem cell over somewhere else because that same stem cell will eventually develop into your red blood cells as well. And then lastly, the last of the formed elements would be platelets. And again, make sure you make the note, make a note of the term thrombocyte. Um, that is the uh, technical term for a platelet. And also note that platelets, once they're developed, they're not true cells at all after the developmental process. They begin as a true cell. They begin just like before with those, um, with those same stem cells. But at the end of the developmental process, they're basically cell fragments. They do not have a nucleus. And so really the only formed element that retains its nucleus would be the white blood cell. And so here you have cell fragments that uh, develop from a large cell uh, inside of the red bone marrow called a megakaryocyte. And you can kind of see a group of platelets here. This is a nice example of a, of a blood smear. We'll look at some of these in lab. You can kind of see some neutrophils over here and um, probably a lymphocyte maybe there and, and a monocyte over here. And here you see some platelets, very small cell fragments. And the platelets are there because they help in the clotting process. All right, one of the last sections we'll look at is hemostasis. Um, hemostasis, hemo again is your prefix for blood and stasis means stopping. And so um, whenever you have, um, basically have five mechanisms in place or five steps in place to try to prevent blood loss. And, and it begins with number one, we'll go through these in order, one through five, you can see them listed here. Uh, number one is vascular spasm. It is what it sounds like. The, it's where the vessels actually um, constrict. They have a spasm or a constriction. Uh, you do have smooth muscle inside of your vessels. And so you have a, uh, a little reflex action that tries to squeeze and uh, kind of put pressure on this. Now notice, even in the diagram, it doesn't completely stop the leak. This is only a temporary solution. It's only just trying to slow down the blood loss. So vascular spasm doesn't really fix the problem. And so we're gonna go through the other steps to see how you actually repair the damage. Step number two um, is what's called a platelet plug formation. Um, if you look at these figures, it kind of outlines what's going on here. Here you have a blood vessel that has some kind of damage and this looks like some kind of internal damage to that blood vessel. There's certain molecules called von Willebrand factor. That's what the VWF stands for up here. Once a cell gets damaged, once the 
blood vessel cells get damaged, um, these von Willebrand factor molecules, they get released. Well, you've got platelets naturally inside of the bloodstream. And when they, whenever these two come together, that makes these platelets uh, adhere. It makes them sticky. And so once that activates, <clears throat> you have platelet adhesion. They start sticking together and uh, they stick down into this area. You have platelet activation. And so, and then um, uh, again, that, that makes them, them sticky together. They stick together and then you have platelet ag aggregation. They all kind of make a, a plug and it tries to uh, clump together. Um, and then once they're activated, they also release other chemicals to try to attract more and more platelets to that area. That forms what's called a platelet plug. Again, this only temporarily, temporarily patches the problem. It hasn't fixed the problem. Um, it's just made a basically a Band-Aid over the, over the uh, cut area. Step three is a little more involved. It's called coagulation. And this is where a clot comes in. Um, a clot is basically protein fibers. It's not platelets, it's protein fibers that form. And those protein fibers are called fibrin. And it forms kind of a dense network or a dense mat of protein tissue that are protein fibers that help to trap the blood and stop it from, from stop you from bleeding. And so um, the picture here is an electron microscope image showing you what actual fibrin, a fibrin clot would look like. And these are red blood cells that have been trapped inside of this fibrin clot. We'll talk a little bit about clotting factors and I'll give you a few examples, but um, the process of coagulation requires uh, many different clotting factors. Most of these are proteins. Um, these are only activated after you have some kind of injury, which should make sense because you don't want a clot to form you know, randomly throughout the body. So the, the clots only form, um, the clotting factors only are activated uh, whenever there's some kind of damage to a vessel. Clotting factors are produced in the liver and they require a vitamin called vitamin K. Your textbook gives a table of clotting factors. Now we're not going to spend time going over all of these, but uh, I just want to show you what these clotting factors are like. This is table 19.2 and they show you many different clotting factors that are involved. Most of these are, are proteins. Some of them are ions like calcium. That's technically uh, an ion necessary for clotting. And um, so many of these though are uh, proteins and many of these still require vitamin K like prothrombin uh, requires a vitamin to actually get that to function. There are three main stages of the process of coagulation. I'll show you another figure. There's a figure in your textbook that uh, shows <clears throat> kind of a detailed view of coagulation. We'll look at three, the three main steps. First of all, one of the main steps is to activate an enzyme called prothrombinase. Um, I know this is an enzyme and uh, most of the time enzymes end in ASE. And so that's a good tip uh, when, you're, when you're reading a question, if you see that the word ends in ASE, it may not always work, but if it ends in ASE, most likely this is an enzyme. So that speeds up the reaction. And so the first stage is to activate prothrombinase. Then the second stage is to, this enzyme, prothrombinase, uh, drives forward a chemical reaction to convert something called prothrombin into thrombin. The thrombin is necessary uh, to convert fibrinogen into fibrin. Now remember, fibrin is your clotting protein that at, at the end. And there's basically two main types of pathways we'll look at very briefly. There's an internal external pathway, um, or they're also referred to as extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic means that uh, there's some damage that has taken place and that chemicals outside of the blood vessel has started the pathway. And I'll show you the diagram that kind of tries to explain that a little bit. Intrinsic means you've got chemicals inside of the blood that get released to continue this pathway. So I found this, um, this diagram from a different textbook, but I think it does a good job of showing you this process. Now, uh, you're not, you're going to, you're not going to have to memorize a process or anything like that. It's just there to show the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway. And I also just mentioned how, how uh, very complicated uh, 
the, uh, the chemical reactions and design of this, uh, of your coagulation process really is. Notice all these different clotting factors. All these arrows represent different clotting factors that have to be in place in order to form this fibrin clot. In other words, you don't want fibrin clot to form randomly or haphazardly in your body because, I mean, that could be fatal, it could be deadly if you have a clot form and you didn't really need it there. And so there's a lot of checks and balances that have to take place in order to form this final fibrin clot. First of all, you get some kind of tissue damage and that begins the extrinsic pathway. You damage some cells somewhere, probably some epithelial cells or, or uh, you know, when you damage your skin cells, you've got some kind of external damage and then that secretes chemicals into the blood. And that kind of begins the intrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway is where collagen is damaged inside of the blood vessel and that starts to release other factors, other protein factors, clotting factors, and eventually they come together and they form uh, something called a factor, or they activate something called factor X, and that brings us to the uh, three main stages that we mentioned. Prothrombinase becomes activated. It causes prothrombin to activate and to turn into thrombin. And it's this thrombin here that causes your fibrinogen. This is just a normal protein um, that you have normally found in your bloodstream, but it's usually turned off. It's usually inactivated. And once thrombin is uh, present, then that fibrinogen will be converted to the sticky, um, very dense protein fibrin, and that actually forms the clot. This is a, uh, just a different view of this, and uh, it's just a simplified version of this, and, uh, and just kind of follow along how it has some kind of damage to a vessel. It starts causing your connective tissues to uh, release some chemicals, and that starts the clotting factors that are normally inactivated to become activated. Notice that calcium is required in certain steps. Here you have the prothrombinase that forms the thrombin and eventually forms your fibrin clot. Step number four is once you've made this uh, very dense fibrin type of clot, uh, it's time now to uh, start the process to get rid of it. And so one of the things that will happen is what's called clot retraction. That clot basically squeezes itself. Um, remember it is protein and so it has some uh, contraction ability there. And so it, it contracts a little bit and it retracts. And when that happens, uh, some of the extra fluid that's inside of the clot, it is squeezed out, that just goes into the bloodstream, and then as it's um, tightening up, it brings together the edges of where you, know, you had some tissue damage. It brings together those edges, that allows the repair process for this collagen that's here to be replaced a little easier. So now your fibroblasts, your cells that are gonna build up the collagen, they can uh, finish working, and they can hopefully you know, build up new tissue to repair, to repair that, uh, that injury. Then step five, the last stage is to get rid of this clot, because you now, now you've got all of this protein here um, that you need to get rid of, and you have to have some enzymes in place to break down this fibrin. So number one, the name of this process is called thrombolysis, where you, where you break down the clot. And so this requires an enzyme called TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator. And that TPA um, uh, causes a, uh, another, uh, it's, it's an enzyme that causes a reaction to take place. It takes a chemical called plasminogen. That's an inactivated form of this, of this uh, protein called plasminogen. In the presence of this enzyme, it converts it into plasmin. This is an active enzyme, and what the job of this active plasmin enzyme is to do is to go through and dissolve, chemically break down all of this clot tissue. Because again, you don't want this clot to dislodge from this vessel without being broken down by the plasmin. Otherwise, you could have you know, a blood clot travel somewhere that's called an emb embolism. And so you could have this uh, clot travel and you know, make a, uh, and, and, and uh, clog up or clot some other place. So to help prevent that from happening, to help regulate the whole coagulation clotting process, you have 
uh, various um, chemicals involved. I'll kind of mention a few of these. For example, prostacyclin. Um, this is a chemical that helps to slow down or, or stop platelets from aggregating and clumping. And so it's released whenever, uh, so, that so, so that you don't have too many or an excess of platelets forming on, around that platelet plug. You need to have the right amount. And so to kind of keep it in balance, it's just a homeostasis mechanism. To keep it in balance, you have prostacyclins present to try to limit or inhibit some of that platelet aggregation so you don't get too many platelets um, to form that platelet plug. Nitric oxide, it's basically a vasodilator, so it opens up the vessels a little bit. And so again, you wanna, you wanna have a clot, but you don't wanna have too much. And so a vasodilator helps to uh, open up the vessel so you don't have a, uh, too much of the coagulation taking place. And then you have several anticoagulants. I'll go through a few of these. You have several anticoagulants. These are just chemicals, and as the name implies, they uh, help to prevent the coagulation from taking place. Most of these block some of the coagulation factors, some of the clotting factors. And so uh, that helps to limit the process of coagulation. You don't want to stop it, but you just want to control it. You want to regulate it. And the last slide here shows you a couple of examples of some of these. You may be familiar with, with at least one of these, but antithrombin, um, this, as the name implies, is a clotting factor that slows down the process of that thrombin activation. So if it, if it slows down thrombin, that means your fibrin, your fibrinogen to fibrin is gonna slow down. And then heparin kind of does the same thing, except it works a little faster. And so this is a commonly used um, anticoagulant in a clinical or hospital setting. And then protein C, um, it works because it breaks down certain clotting factors. You don't need to necessarily know which ones, but factors five and factors eight um, are clotting factors that this chemical called protein C will help to degrade. If you slow down those clotting factors, then you slow down the process of clot formation.